Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant. For your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. This is the word of the Lord. Mark Dever, the pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church and also the founder of Nine Marks Ministry, uh, once wrote this. At the same time, however, the kind of trust that we are called to give to our fellow imperfect humans in this life, be they family or friends, employers or government officials, or even leaders in the church, can never fully, can never finally be earned. It must be given as a gift, a gift in faith, in trust, more of the one who gives than of the leaders he has given. So I'm going to welcome you back to our continuing series on the letter to the Romans titled The Power of the Gospel. And this series is aptly named because, as Paul says, the gospel is the very power of God to save those who believe, which is what Paul has explained in great detail in the first 11 chapters of Romans. In that first part of Romans, Paul masterfully unpacks for us the marvelous theology of the gospel. Paul explains what the gospel is, the bad news of our condition, that we are sinners under the wrath and the condemnation of God, but it's also the good news of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, what God has done to rescue us through his own Son. He also explained how the gospel works and the blessing that the gospel gives those who believe, namely peace with him. He also talks about the freedom the gospel provides to those who believe and the immutable hope that all believers have because when they put their faith in Christ, we are completely and totally safe in the hands of God. The essence of the gospel is all of mankind has fallen short of God's glorious standard of righteousness, and that we all, because of that, deserve God's wrath. That God owes us nothing but wrath and judgment, but God, in his grace and mercy, by the counsel of his own will, sent his son, Jesus, into the world to live live for our righteousness and then to die for our sins, and then to be raised three days later, proving that God's justice had been satisfied. And the promise is, the immutable promise is that all those who believe will be saved and can have assurance of that salvation. And that is the power of the gospel that we see in Romans 1 through 11. But as we move through Romans chapter 12 into Romans chapter 16, Paul tells us how we're to live now in light of the power of the gospel. Now that we have been saved, how do we live in light of that salvation? Well, beginning in chapter 12, Paul reminds us that because of the gospel, we have been restored in our relationship with God. And because of that, we ought to live that way. 
We ought to live our lives in light of God's mercy as a living sacrifice to God, not allowing ourselves to be shaped by the world around us through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's word. We're to be transformed from the inside out, seeking to live a life that is pleasing to God. Because the gospel, because of the gospel, we have been restored in our relationship with God. And we also have been restored in our relationship with our fellow man. Because of the transforming power of the gospel, we are now empowered to live radically different lives towards all of those around us. And Paul has been unpacking for us what that looks like. And he began with the family of God, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul explains how we now, because of Christ, belong to the same family, the family of God. And we ought to humbly submit to one another and to love each other and serve each other. And we're, and, and we're to care for one another as part of a family, remembering that our union with Christ brings us into union with one another. Paul explains that we have a deep, sacrificial love for one another and that we demonstrate that that love and how we treat one another. That, that, that's how the world ultimately will see who we are. But then Paul moves on to explain how we to live this transformed life towards those who are not part of God's family, especially towards those who are hostile towards us or even hostile to the God we serve. They, for all intents and purposes, are what Paul would call our enemies, whether they're the overt enemies who are really out to get us or the spiritual enemies who really seem to be friends on the outside but hate the God that we love. Paul tells us that we are to live in harmony with them, that we're to live lives of harmony with those around us. We are to find those common things that we can live in harmony with, and we are to seek to live at peace with those around us. In fact, he even goes so far to say, as much as it depends on you, well, brothers and sisters, a lot of it depends on us. As much as it depends on us, we are to live at peace with those around us. And Paul even says that we're to bless and do good to those that would be our enemies, those who hate God and those who would even hate us to our faces. And that we're to trust in God's justice, knowing that he's the one who ultimately will settle scores and that we are also to be compassionate to everyone. If there's something that marks the Christian life is that we have the capacity to be compassionate even to the worst. Why? Because God was compassionate to us who were once the worst. And so Paul says, in light of the gospel, we're to live out this radical new life in a way that honors God before all people, including those who love us back and including those who just simply could stand, couldn't stand the sight of us. We're to love both family and foe. And Paul could have just simply stopped there. And I think that would have been a pretty complete thought, but he doesn't. He actually continues because there's another point that he needs to make. He makes a point to draw our attention to another group of people. A group of people that I think, if we're going to just be honest with ourselves, right? If, if we're going to just start confessing, I'll confess first, right? There's a group of people that, that we just struggle to live with. And those people are those who have authority over us. That's what we're going to see here in Romans chapter 13. I want you to understand, like, if there was a point in my life, in my Christian life, where I have struggled, especially early on, it's this, in this set of relationships. I, by nature, am rebellious. I'm, by nature, anti-authoritarian. I don't like to be told what to do. Even now as a teacher, I was talking to my wife. I said, you know, for the first time in a long time, I actually have an official boss. There's a principal of high school, right? And uh, there was uh, something he said, like, hey, I just want you to know, this is how you're going to do it. And my initial reaction was, is like, who are you telling me that? But I'm like, you know what? You're the boss. Yes, sir. Right? So I want you to know, like, when I'm talking about this, this isn't like this way. It's this way, too. Okay. So Paul is unpacking for us how to live by the power of the gospel towards those who have God-given authority in our lives. Now, before we jump into chapter 13, I want to say is we got to clear up some errors because I'm going to tell you if there is a chapter in Romans that people really want to get twisted and get wrong, it's going to be this. And uh, so there's three basic errors. The first one is the, the error of extremes. Just like the gospel, um, 
has two errors of extremes that lead into a ditch ultimately. In fact, with the gospel, on the one hand, what you have is a, a extreme antinomianism over here, which is the idea that because we were saved by grace through faith, that there is no purpose for the law at all. So don't talk to me about the law and being obedient, right? And then on the other hand, we have over here is the extreme of legalism, right? Which is the idea because God is holy and has a righteous standard that we ought to then try to obey this external set of rules to be in right relationship with God. Both of these extremes are in error. The gospel balances these things because it is true we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, and not by obedience to the law whatsoever. But those who have been saved have been radically transformed and their lives will begin to grow in holiness and obedience to God. It's just the overflow of who they are. There is a balance. We need to avoid the extremes and the same thing with respect to Romans 13. Because there are two extreme positions when it comes to this. First is the people who have this kind of idea that Romans 13 is talking about blind obedience to the government, no matter what the government says or no matter what the government tells us to do. There are some people who believe that Romans 13 teaches blind obedience to the government, that if the government tells you to do something, that you need to comply without ever even questioning it. This was the rationale that many in Christendom used when they said that church is not essential during the pandemic. This was the rationale that many people used when they told pastors and churches, you're supposed to remain closed. You are not Christian if you're opening your church back up. This is the same rationale that people used to try to guilt people into taking a vaccination that some people by their consciences didn't feel that it was right for them to take. In fact, there were some would even say that, that it's, it was sinful because they weren't obeying the government. The government says to do it, then you should do it. Romans 13 is what we, what we heard. By the way, what's interesting is this was the same approach that many in the government took to silence the Lutheran church in the 1930s when, um, when Hitler rose to power. That, that was the justification. You're the church. You need to obey Romans 13. You Christians just need to shut up and do what the government tells you to do. That is one extreme view of Romans 13. The other extreme is this hypercritical approach to the government that believes that only people who are Christian leaders are the ones that we really are supposed to be submitted to. That only those who are truly good and noble you know, are worthy of our submission. That somehow that, 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 that their authority over us has to start with them being born-again Christians, and, and we are free to push back and rebel and refuse to submit if they don't see things the way we do theologically. And, and that we, especially when we don't like a law that gets passed, that we, that we try to use the Bible as justification for not obeying. There are people who feel it's morally an obligation to not pay taxes to the government because the government's run by secularists. There are people that believe that, that I shouldn't have to pay taxes because they're doing things with my money that I, I don't agree with. Despite what Jesus himself said, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. We need to recognize that Romans 13 isn't advocating a blind obedience to the government no matter what. And it isn't suggesting that we only have, that we only have to follow what we consider godly leaders. All right. The second error that many have with this text is, is influenced by our culture's misunderstanding of the idea of separation of church and state. There are a lot of people today that wrongly believe that separation of church and state means that Christians and churches aren't supposed to have anything to say about what happens in the political arena or what happens in the government. There are people that, that believe that because we are Christians and that we're a church, that we should never have any voice in those areas, that, 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 that politics and faith are not compatible. We got to keep those separate. By the way, that's a, a political statement by itself. But the, but the actual idea of separation church and state actually comes from a letter from Thomas Jefferson to a Baptist association that was assuring them that the federal government was not going to start a state church. And his point was the government has no business regulating those affairs and, and mandating how the church worships. And so it's never in his wildest dreams did he think that the church would never have anything to say about politics. 
The third error that people make with respect to this text is to simply think that this is only about our governmental relationships. And though it is true that Paul mentions governing authorities, the application that we draw from this text actually is much broader than that. Because there are many layers of God-given, God-ordained, God-orchestrated authority. We certainly have the federal government and state government and city government and county government and law enforcement officers. We also have teachers and coaches and employers and managers and pastors and husbands and parents. There are all manner of layers of authority that God has invested in to fallible humans by God's counsel of his own will. What Paul talks about here is applicable to the ways that people have authority in our lives and the way that we have authority in the lives of other people. Paul is unpacking for us the scope, but also the limits to that authority and also our responsibility as Christians to submit ourselves to that authority. So turn with me to Romans chapter 13, verse 1, and let me just kind of walk you through this. Paul says, let everyone be, every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. The first thing that we just simply need to come to terms with is everyone is subject to some sort of human authority. That's the part that I had to take a deep breath, right? Every person, whether you like it or not, whether you want it to be that way or not, whether you scream to heavens or not about it, every person is subject to some sort of human authority, period, end of story. That is a reality of the world. It is the reality that God has instituted. Everyone is subject to someone else's authority, and Paul is commanding willing submission to that authority. That's the second part of that. Not only are we to recognize that we're under authority, but we are to willingly submit to that authority. And I'm going to tell you right now, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of things that that God in his law forbids that I didn't struggle with. But this one right here, I'm going to tell you, just be straightforward. I struggle with this a lot. Right. Praise the Lord. Right. Paul's commanding a willing submission to authority. He says, let us be subject. That is a willingness to be passive in that. That is a willingness to relinquish control. That is a willingness to say, all right, you're in control. You're the authority. And the reason for that is those who are in authority are there. The rationale is those who are in authority are there because God put them there. Whew, that was another one. Like when I was confront my frustrations over this come in face to face with the truth that the people that are in authority in my life are in my life because God put them there. And even as a youth pastor, when kids would come to, to church and their parents weren't like seeing it or having it, you know, and, and, and like, like I, there was a couple of kids that one time wanted to get baptized. They made professions of faith, ready to get baptized. Mom and dad said, no. And I had come face to face with like, there was a temptation in me to say, I'll baptize them anyway. But then I remember, what am I doing? I'm setting the wrong example for them because they're still supposed to be submitted willingly to the authority over them. And guess who's in authority over them? Their parents. We need to submit to that authority willingly because because we think that those who have authority over us, be it our boss or, or the Senate, or the permit department at the building department, or your husband or your parents, sometimes we think that somehow that they need to earn or be worthy of our submission. I'm going to tell you right now, that right there is, is, is an idea that we hold on to that is not biblical. There are wives that will say, I'll submit to my husband when he becomes worthy of submission. Right? There are people that will say, hey, I'll submit to my pastor's leadership when he becomes worthy of my submission. There are people that saying things the same thing with the government or their parents. My kids will be submit to their teacher's authority when their teacher, you know, is deserving of that, you know, submission. The reality is, is the scriptures don't teach that. 
Scriptures teach that we are to be subject to authority because God is the one who put them in authority, that he is the author of authority. It's not because they earned it. It's not because they deserved it. And it's not because they're Christians. And it's not because they represent or reflect our own interests, but because God put them there. God is the author of authority. In fact, the word authority has a root word, author, in it. And it implies that there's a power vested by the great author himself. God is the one who places people in authority in our lives. And our respect and submission to that authority comes because of our reverence and submission and love for God. Brothers and sisters, if you just own that, it'll change everything. Our submission and obedience to those in authority is out of trust and out of obedience and reverence to our God. You say that you love God and that you trust him. This is the the litmus test to prove it. As Bodhi Bauckham says, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. As Mark Dever says, at the same time, however, the kind of trust that we are called to give to our fellow imperfect humans in this life, be they family or friends, employers or government officials or even leaders in a church, can never finally be earned. It must be given as a gift, a gift in faith, in trust, more of the God who gives than the leaders he has given. The truth is we are all under authority and we're to submit to that authority because the author said so. Then Paul writes, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. Man, it just gets better, doesn't it? To resist rightful authority is to resist God himself. That's what Paul is saying. There's no weather way, there's no hermeneutical way around that. Which means to resist rightful authority is to be in sin. To resist authority is to resist God, and that is sinful behavior. Now understand, this isn't a call to blindly be obedient when the government calls us to do something immoral or is against God's law. We need to be wise in this. Right? When, when the Chinese government says that you have to get an abortion after having two children, we are not morally obligated to, to obey such a commandment. When Nazi Germany said that you need to tell us where all the Jews are so they can exterminate them, we're not morally obligated to obey that. In fact, I would say that we are morally obligated to to refuse that, to resist that. So what Paul is saying is when governing authorities exercise their God-given right, to resist them is to resist God himself. In his rebellion to God. It's, it's, it, it, I'll never forget this, this video. There's this like lady, she obviously is old enough to be a grandmother. I'm assuming that she was a grandmother. But anyway, um, she's getting a ticket. And she's being very sarcastic and surly with the, the, the police officer who is being very professional um, for the, what he's getting back. And, and he says, you need to sign the ticket. And she says, I won't do it. And he says, if you won't do it, then I'm going to have to arrest you. You're going to have to. And she just kept refusing, kept refusing, kept refusing. Finally says, okay, ma'am, step out of the car. You're under arrest. Now it's, it's changed. And instead of like lawfully complying – you know, with the, the lawful command that he had given, she just continues to resist and says, I'm not doing it. I'm, you're not going not gonna to pull me out of here, right? Then she proceeds to just take off because she feels like she is morally right to do that because she didn't like some little snot-nosed cop telling her what to do, right? And so he then proceeds to chase her, and he drags her out of the car, and she's fighting with him, and finally he tases her and puts her on the ground, all over for not just doing the simple thing that she was morally obligated to do. And and what's worse is she's probably, listening to her talk, she's probably would identify herself as a born-again Christian. What Paul is talking about is when governing authorities exercise their God-given right to resist 
To resist them is to resist God himself. It's rebellion against God. It is sin. By the way, right? If you look at what culture is actually teaching us now, it's complete opposite of this. You see, our culture has it backwards. Our culture during the pandemic was saying you have to comply with the government regulations without ever questioning whether it is to restrict your movements or not go and be with your loved ones or gather for worship, right? But then it says, but then the government or the same culture is saying, we need to just not prosecute people who are criminals. Right? The same culture is the one that gets that, that takes the side of the criminal who ends up resisting arrest and ends up getting into a situation where they end up getting killed or or, or worse, when cities burn down. I mean, during that time, if you remember, pastors were being arrested and put in jail, and they were locking the doors on churches while entire blocks of cities were up in flames and being taken over by hoodlums. Our culture is saying, obey the government when they're not actually doing what is right, but then... They're saying it's okay to disobey the government when they're doing their actual godly duty. But even worse, our culture is saying don't prosecute shoplifters and vandals, but prosecute parents who want to exercise their right over their, over their children in, in order to make choices what's right for them in their long-term health. And so again, this is not a call to blind obedience, but it's a call to submit to God and his God-given authority into those he's invested it in. And that includes your manager at work. Whew. Talk about a sore spot for a lot of people, right? That person that's your boss, your manager, is there because of God's sovereignty. Right. Or how about your kid's teacher? Your kid's teacher is positioned in your child's life by God for their good. And again, it's not about blind obedience. It's about the fact that many parents fail to teach their children the proper respect and submission to authority. Anybody that has been in the classroom has seen that very thing borne out. And whenever there is a problem, it's always the teacher's fault. Not recognizing that, guess what? Yes, your little lovely child that you love so much, perfect little child, is a fallen, broken sinner who will lie to your face. We're to submit to God-given authority in all levels, and, re- and it's rebellion against God to not do so. Now, looking at, the, at, at verse 3, we see both the reason why we're to submit and the limits that authority that God has granted. Paul writes, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive approval. You see, the purpose of human authority is threefold. First, it's to enact God's will in the world. Second, it is to be an example of good conduct for the world. And third, it's to be human authority is to act as a restraint to evil, which means that human authority is is a means of grace. It's God's grace restraining evil in the world around us. That's why why God has invested authority in this as he does, right? It's to enact his will. What do we pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. And it's to be an example of good conduct to the world. Those in authority are to lead by example. Nobody despises anyone more than a hypocrite. And then it's to act as a restraint to evil. And we don't have to look very far to see why this is so important. When parents don't parent their children, evil is not restrained. Brother and sister Met and Aaron had their car stolen. And not only stolen, but wrecked. And not by some grown-up, professional hardened criminal by a kid in elementary school. Just just let that settle into your hearts and minds. A kid whose parents just don't care. I mean, and that's, that's an understatement. 
And what's worse is this is a kid that has been part of this church many times. He has come to to our church services many times. He has stood right here in the front rows with a bunch of other kids singing with us and then has gone to class and had our teachers pour their heart and their love into these kids. A kid who is known for violence and vandalism and a kid who is now in desperate need of your prayer because he is on the path to to a, a life of pain and heartache. There is no there is no good end for the path that he's on at this moment. But there seems to be very little that we can do because his parents are not there to guide him or lead him. There's no one with with supervisory authority over him. He just runs the streets doing what he wants to do. Right? By the way, there's a bunch of them youngins like that in our community. And it's the same with teachers. When teachers don't teach and enforce the rules, evil is not restrained. And when governments won't prosecute crime and hold criminals responsible, evil is not restrained. And this is something we've seen, again, all over California. People are walking into businesses and loading up carts and bags and just walking out. And nobody can do anything. There's no consequences. Crime is on the rise everywhere. Why? Because many government agencies are just failing to do what they're called to do. Human authority is supposed to restrain evil. And when it does, when it does that, it is a terror to those who do wrong, not a terror to those who do good. But how do we then define what is good and evil? What do we, how do we define what is right and wrong? How do we know when the government is ruling rightly and justly? The answer is simply this. It is the law of God. The law of God is the very foundation to all civil societies. The law of God regulates how we relate to God and how we relate to others. And by the way, it is the law of God that is the foundation of the entire legal system of the United States. As much as many atheists would would hate to admit that, it is the absolute truth. Even how we use case law in the United States is exactly how the scriptures use case law. And it's obvious when man-made law upholds or doesn't violate the law of God. When it upholds the law of God, then the law is good and just. That's why the law, man-made law, punishing thievery and stealing is good. And we should expect if we follow the law, then we have no reason to fear. We don't steal somebody else's stuff. If we don't commit violence on someone else, we shouldn't live in fear. But if you break the law, those in authority have the right to prosecute you. That's what Paul is saying here. But notice Paul also says, for if we, for he, talking about those in authority, is God's servant for your good. If you, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. This is the point we need to be clear about. All those in authority are granted that authority to serve God and to serve other people. Authority is never granted for the one that's, for the one that has the authority. It's always granted for God's purposes in the service of mankind. In fact, the word that is used here is the same word that we get the word deacon. The government and those who in authority are servants of God and of the people, and they are granted authority to punish wrongdoers. They are granted authority by God to force compliance and punish those who break the law. But notice it's about punishing wrongdoers. This is important, right? Because when we think about Romans 13 and we want to throw that out as justification for our position, we need to understand it's about punishing wrongdoers, not Punishing our political enemies. It's not about coercing a population to adopt a certain agenda. It's not trying to force people to violate their conscience and disobey God. God has granted those in authority the power they have to enforce the consequences that come from breaking the law. 
And then Paul writes, Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. This right here is important enough that our confession took some time to address it in chapter 24 um, in, in, in a chapter titled Civil Government. And I'll just read for you what the confession states. By the way, if you just ever Google the 1689 London Confession, um, you will get a couple of links. And if you click on the Founders Ministry link, it'll take you right to the one that's in plain English. And it reads this. It says, God, the supreme Lord and king of the whole world, has ordained civil authorities to be under him and over the people for his own glory and public good. For this purpose, he has armed them with the power of the sword to defend and encourage those who do good and to punish evildoers. It goes on to say in in paragraph two, Christians may lawfully accept to carry out the duties of public office when called to do so. In performing their office, they must certainly maintain justice and peace according to the wholesome law of each kingdom or the political entity. To carry out these duties, they are authorized now under the New Testament to wage war in just and necessary situations. And then paragraph three gets to the point and says, because civil authorities are established by God for the purposes stated, we should submit in the Lord to them in everything lawful that they require. We should submit not only to fear of punishment, but also for the sake of conscience. We ought to make requests and prayers for the kings and everyone in authority so that under their rule we may live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. The scriptures are very clear. Our confession is very clear. We are to respect and submit to those in authority even when we didn't vote for them, even if we don't like them, even if they require what they require of us isn't convenient for us. I mean, the reality is, is Christians can be really, really kind of like, kind of crazy about this. In one respect, you know, we're, we, we ought to be very quick to say, you know, the government has no right to tell us to not assemble, right? But in another respect, right, we have to, that we have Christians who just will find, find every way to not comply when the government says, hey, you got to pay another 500 bucks. And I want you to know, I don't like paying the government any more than I have to. But if, if it's the law, then I need to do it. Paul says that they're a servant of God for our good. And then he says, for because of this, you also pay taxes. How many of you wish that the Bible never said nothing about this right here? Yeah, okay. For because of this, you also pay taxes. And by the way, this is in first century Rome, right? This is in the world where, like, without representative government, right? This is in a world where local authorities just decided on their own what their tax rate was. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all, all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom re- respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And we can go on and on, right? But what, I, what this comes down to, for us who are transformed by the gospel, we Christians who now have brand new lives, who are new creatures, who have been renewed in our relationship with God. We are to live as an example for the rest of the world and how we submit to the authorities over us. The thing that we have to come to terms with is now that we live for Christ, our lives are bigger than just us. And it's not just about us. We must remember, right, how we live isn't about simply here and now. How we live now is in light of eternity. And everything we do ought to be thought in those terms. In fact, as we wrap this up, just turn with me really quick to Acts chapter 16. I think there's a story here that I think bears out, I think, what Paul's trying to get at. In Acts chapter 16, in verse 1, It reads, as we were going to the place of prayer, 
We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that there was, that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept and practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them in prison, and ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison, and fastened their feet in stocks. The thing I want you to notice is that Paul and Silas were wrongfully accused. And and the justice system failed them. They were quickly drugged before an unfriendly court, and they were physically punished for crimes they didn't commit. And they were thrown into jail unjustly. But notice how Paul responds to this. It says... About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Do you imagine, like, as we as Americans, would that be our posture? Would we still be, like, seething and very frustrated and screaming and hollering and talking about how, you know, how unjust this is? They were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke, he saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, we are all here. Paul and Silas didn't complain about their plight. They worshiped God, and when they were supernaturally released from their bonds, they didn't escape. Instead, they stayed, and they kept the jailer who had locked them up and probably was part of you know, the torment that they'd suffered. They kept him from killing himself. How many of us, when we are wronged, are going to be really quick to turn around and really do something sacrificial to, to do something right by somebody else? I say that because, like, in my own mind, I'm thinking, maybe I don't say nothing until at least he kind of cuts himself kind of deep. You know, then I might say something. You know what I mean? Like, Paul kept this man from killing himself. Then it goes on and said, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. You and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. And he took them in the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with their entire household that he had believed in God. Whew, what an unlikely turn of events. Now, here's the thing. I mention this story because not to say that we need to go looking for abuse at the hands of the government. We're not masochists. We're not looking for trouble. And, and all right, there is certainly a time and place to stand up for t- against tyranny. I mention this because we have been radically transformed by the power of the gospel, and we have been restored in a relationship with God, and nothing can take that away from you. That's the foundation of your hope. No matter what happens, no matter who's in authority in our lives, it doesn't matter how corrupt the government may may become. It doesn't matter if they outlaw your faith. The power of the gospel transcends all human power, and it's a power that truly sets us free. And because of that freedom, 
We ought to live as Christ's ambassadors before the rest of the world. We ought to live not representing our own interests. We ought to live to represent the interests of the king, the one who is truly in authority. And because of that, the world ought to see in us humility, patience, grace, and a willingness to go the extra mile to the, to, in order to submit to those in authority. Remember, Jesus said, if somebody compels you to go a mile, then go with him the extra mile. Not because they deserve it, but because of the authority the king has already given them. We want the world to see that our faith isn't something we just talk about, but it's something that we live out in front of them. Even when people are jerks, even when it's really, really hard, even if it means that obedience is going to mean suffering. Not to mention, we need to live in light of God's sovereignty. The truth is, God is the one who's in control. And what we, we affirm and we confess and we believe is he is in control of all of the details of your life. And you need to trust him through all of those circumstances, including the times when those in authority over you seem to be really incompetent. Or those in authority have seem to be self-interested and even downright wrong at times. I'm not saying we need to obey when those in authority try to get us to violate God's law. But what I'm saying is we need to shed this tendency in all of us to push back and rebel every time someone is exercising some authority over us. We ought to be seen as willing, humble servants who are quick to do good, who are quick to go the extra mile. We ought to be seen as those who want to live peaceably with all. We ought to be seen as those who value the reputation of our God more than our own comfort. And finally, we need to live with eternity in mind. Paul's in this story isn't antagonistic towards his jailer. Ultimately, he's very compassionate. Whew. This is a place that can be very difficult for us to jump off, but I mean, this is, this is the goal. He's compassionate, and this man and his family become believers who have joined the family of God. This man who was once his very real enemy is now his family in union with Christ, which means union with Paul, a closeness that is unimaginable. We need to remember that God has positioned us where we are to influence the world around us for his glory. We need to see that in difficult circumstances, even when we are under the yoke of someone else, that there is an opportunity to impact eternity for someone. And so let us be wise in how we stand against what we think is oppression But more than that, let us be quick to live for God and his glory in every possible circumstance. And so what do we do with this? It's always the same. Repent and believe the gospel. If you're not in Christ, put your faith and trust in him. And the promise is you will be saved and you will be set free. A freedom that you will never know any other way. You can be free from every human institution. You can think that you're free from every human authority, but you were a slave to the enemy and a slave to your own sin. But Christ can set you free. Repent and believe the gospel. And then if you are in Christ and your heart is heavy, then rest in that fact that Jesus did it all. Jesus paid it all. It's not anything that you can do. It's what Christ has done for you. And then finally, rescue the lost. This is the message that we have. This is the message that will transform the world. We see the evil that's around us and we want to go to war and battle with people and we think it's going to be settled in politics. Those are temporary measures. What's going to change the world, what's going to change hearts and minds is the power of the gospel. Because as Paul says, it is the power to save those who believe. 
You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.